everybody, and welcome back to the Truminati Podcast, episode 223. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined today by the John Friedman and Florian Simbeck of L.A., Jesse and Alex. You're already making me Google something. Who the hell? Those are- sound like Dinotopia characters. <laughs> Real people. Real people's names. Real people's names. What are their names again? John Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N-N. Possible ufologist. And Florian Simbeck. Definite ufologist. <laughs> no, comedy duos. They both starred in the movie Eric and Stefan, a German comedy delight that people love from the year 2000. Uh, and they went on to have great careers afterward. People really love that movie, though. It's like four and a half, five stars. I mean, look, I'm, I'm a worldly guy, right? Like, maybe yeah, yeah. I've seen him. But, you know, 23-year-old German comedy that looks like a double-A version of There's Something About Mary or Dude, Where's My Car? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really care which one I am. I gotta say, I I, I don't really feel close to Told either of them, one way or another. It's a, call it None a cultural. Got canceled a, as far as I could I could tell, they yeah. seem to both have good careers. A cultural miscommunication. I feel like I'm like an alien from Arrival compared to this guy. Can I actually? That reminds me, boys. I've actually added a movie to my repertoire. Is it The Arrival? No, it's not. I don't think you'll be able. I really don't think you're gonna guess. This is a very bizarre and kind of strange movie to add to my list of movies seen. Hocus Pocus. No, I have seen that movie though. A great movie. You're the guy. For, you're the kid from Hocus Pocus. Actually, it's right. a movie from 1973. What movie? What movie did you watch? And it's not an English movie. <laughs> what movie did you watch? What? I know you had all. Every you could have chose every movie. Fantastic Planet. Fantastic Planet. Fantastic Planet. What on earth? I am surprised you've never heard of that movie. I thought this was something you would have heard of. Is this like the slightly animated? Oh no, I know what movie. I know what. Yeah, I know what. Movie yeah, it's this all is. animated, but it's animated weird. Big blue aliens have little humans as pets. Yeah, this sounds. This sounds like a you film. Yeah, yeah. It was weird. I didn't. Not ex- I, I wasn't by choice. It was started without my input, and then I was just like, oh, I'm watching it now. Question, who started it? The girl, friend. Why? Because, I. good question. She didn't even know why. She just said it looked interesting on the streaming service she was using, and then hit play. You know what? God bless her. What else was being used at the time? What do you mean? Were you high? I'm always high. Were you high, boy? I, don't, I can't say I like liked the movie, and I don't think I'd ever watch it again. But it was interesting. It was very bizarre. I can't say that I liked it or that I'd watch it again, but it was interesting. But I but I saw I sat through the whole thing. I did. I'm very proud of myself. And I figured I'd also bring it up. It felt like an animal <laughs> rights movie in a bizarre way. It was uh, so amazing that he watched a movie that even though he did not like it and will not watch it again, he wanted to talk about it. I did. It was such a right. weird fucking movie. It's like seeing it a dead a body. Movie. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, wait, what? <laughs> I don't want to see yeah, it again, I but yeah. I just need to tell it was someone. Crazy. <laughs> I, need, I need to tell somebody. <laughs> you can tell us if you murdered somebody over at patreon.com slash Chiluminati pod. Please don't do implicate us in any way in your crimes. Do not confess to your crimes do on our fine website. <laughs> do not bring your horrible shame to our ad-free episodes or to our... Uh, Rotten Popcorn Show, or to our mini-sodes, or to our custom bespoke art from Mel, the greatest artist that we've ever worked with in this capacity, or, uh... What is happening to you? You know, any of the other great things on our Patreon. Jesse, I'm not sure what's happening right now. I mean, this is a stretch, okay? This is a stretch. He's short-circuiting, like, in real time. Do not bring your murder to any of that. That's I'm just going off the segue you tossed me. You said Could I could I like create a can I create a share your murder tier? No! no do not no. share like your murder. A million dollars. <laughs> Please do not share if you are a murderer. I'll put it at the bottom, like no guarantee we won't tell the cops, right? My like, new advertising campaign is if you are a murderer, please do not sign up at patreon.com slash chillmanipod. Thank you. And how about this? Ha ha, we got you. This is the actual great benefit of being on the Patreon. For free, you get a beautifully recorded live recording of our show in Los Angeles. That show that we just did in Los Angeles, it's yours for free. If you're out there and you don't want to sign up for our Patreon, if you're crazy and you don't want to sign up for our Patreon, you can just buy it. At the same, at our Patreon. Just come to patreon.com. Yeah. Are we also doing another show? Shouldn't we advertise yeah, yeah. So that? Here's, here, yeah, yeah. We got all kinds of shit. So December 3rd at Terragram Ballroom. The the tickets, I don't think, are going to be on sale for another few days. What do you mean? 
It's, That's not up to me. Month. I don't get to make that choice. <laughs> Let's get them tickets on sale. Yeah, get your get your wallets ready, motherfuckers. Those are going to be for sale. We'll be at the Telegram Ballroom again. But also on top of getting the audio of the live show in that package, you're going to get the poster, the digital poster that went with the show, and a video edited to get with the audio together in time with the sl- uh, the PowerPoint presentations that were the first half of that show. Mathis loves a PowerPoint. I don't know if you if you've never seen us live, you might not know that Mathis loves a PowerPoint. And you're going to learn. And you will see how good he is at making PowerPoints. And the answer is he's like a four out of ten. Maybe like a three out of ten on, wow, the, wow. on, the, on the style scale. But sure. in terms of heart, he's like the Grinch because it's three sizes too big. You feel me? Hey, the Grinch after he found love. That's right. And uh, yeah, and uh, that's a big heart. I'd be, I'm, a, I'm a little bit worried about the Grinch, actually. But please, patreon.com slash too many pod. Buy the old show. Listen to it. Sign up for the Patreon and get it for free. It's all happening now. Get ready to buy tickets for a show someday on December 3rd. <laughs> Maybe by the time that this episode is out, the tickets will be live. But I don't know. Maybe. We just want to sell them. We just want to sell just- them. Telegram <laughs> Ballroom, Los so Angeles. Bad. Anyone on the Discord will tell you. It'll be a totally different show than October show as well. Yeah, I'm writing a totally new show outline with no, no old bits. None. Jesse, you had your hand up like you were going to say something for a second. I don't know what happened there. No, I am so excited. That's it. Okay, yeah, Jesse's no, excited. I'm, excited too. I'm so excited. <laughs> And I'm just getting happy. Jesse's excited too. Jesse's also excited. We're we're all gonna be. I'm about to lose control, and I think I'm It's gonna be the wear a Santa hat for Mathis thon show. Okay. Yeah. No. no you know what? I don't mean, help cool. him. Don't help him. Let him. Let him get the hype going. I have to work on my improv somehow. Yeah. Let him go. This is all I can do. He wants you to wear a Santa hat at the show because it's on December third, twenty two yeah. days before Christmas. Right. He wants you to show up time. in a Santa hat in front of this thing. I don't want. I want to. I'm going to spoil it for you right now. I don't know if I'm going to make this thing Christmas themed. Okay. Okay. I'm going to spoil it for you right now. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you just want the Santa hats. I just want the Santa hats. It. it doesn't have to be okay, Christmas themed. Then how about this? Any sort of. We can be okay, jolly. Then let me revise it. Instead of just Santa hats, let's open this up. Let's diversify this. Any sort of long Ebenezer Scrooge esque sleeping cap will do. Anything that's long and triangle shaped. Oh my god. Time out. Boys, boys, shut yeah. up. Shut your mouths. Be quiet. Okay. Follow me here. Yes. Can we create? Do we have the time? So imagine instead of the white brim, yeah. neon green, <laughs> the top part instead of red, yeah. black, <laughs> and the little dongle at the end instead of a poof ball, <laughs> alien face. Can we make it sell those? <laughs> what are we doing wrong? I will message the Yeti tonight. <laughs> oh wait, what if it's what if it's the Chulani logo on the top? That is the craziest that piece of merchandise forward. that you it have ever. It just goes up into a perfect triangle point. It's just like a worse beanie. <laughs> <laughs> but it's for it's but Christmas. it's for the yeah, holidays. It's like, a holiday, it's like a non-denominational Chuluminati holiday triangle. Yeah. Cap. <laughs> Only five will ever be yeah, made. They each cost one thousand dollars a piece. <laughs> Yeah. Good. What, 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 what are we here for today? What's the vibes? Today is a fun vibe. I'm actually really excited about this one because it's just a one-off episode, but there's a lot to talk about. Uh, today, we're talking about uh, the Northeast kind of paranormal flap that's known as the Bridgewater Triangle. The immediate thoughts are going to be like Bermuda Triangle, obviously. Uh, but do you guys know anything about the Bridgewater Triangle whatsoever? I feel like we talked about it briefly once. We did it on the live show like years ago. Very you, quickly. You talked not about in depth. it like, yeah, like briefly. And I know that it's like a New England land base. I was going to say, it sounds Northeastern American. Very, very. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's uh, the actual where it's located is nestled south, is it in the southeast part of Massachusetts. There lies a 200 square mile stretch of land sat between the towns of Abington, Rehoboth, and Freetown. Within this triangle paranormal titillation, the towns of Brockton, Easton, Bridgewater, Rain, and Berkeley, Dighton, and Taunton also reside within the Bridgewater Triangle's boundaries. And much like the Bermuda Triangle, it's not there's no like hyper specific pieces of land that are like if it's on the edge of the Bridgewater Triangle, sometimes it's considered part of it, sometimes it's not. Um, much like the Bermuda Triangle and how that area can often change depending on who's talking about it and where it's being talked about. Uh, Bridgewater Triangle has similar issues as well. Um, and uh, But unlike the Bermuda Triangle, where ships and planes are often thought to vanish without a trace, 
the Bridgewater Triangle is much more akin to like a beacon to the paranormal world. Well, yes, people have gone missing within the triangle. It's more so a paranormal flap, if Skin you will. Skinwalker vibes. Exactly. So the Skinwalker Ranch vibes. Yeah. Um, it's something of, and, and unlike, say, the Bermuda Triangle, but the Bridgewater Triangle is something of a quote unquote new hotspot in paranormal activity, kind of only defined in the 1970s. While we do have lots of stuff that occurred in that area prior, The actual boundaries of this place were defined in the 70s. And at the center of this paranormal location sits the Hockamock Swamp, a place of historical importance and archaeological importance. And we're going to get a lot of like fun names like that, Hockamock Swamp, because uh, we're going to talk about a little bit of history here. Now, during the 17th century, the Hockamock Swamp was used as a fortress of sorts by the Wampanoag tribe. That was the predominating tribe of natives in the area who were fighting and defending against an invasion by early English settlers. The Wampanoag are Native American people of the northeastern woodlands based in southeastern Massachusetts and historical parts of eastern Rhode Island. My home state. Shout out to the small ass state of Rhode Island. You can drive from top to bottom in 45 minutes. I miss that place sometimes. It's also trash. I hate it. Complicated relationship he has. With I do home, have a very complicated state. relationship with Rhode Island. You know, it's just such a weird state. Uh, it got bank. You know, it, we had fucking that Boston fucking what's his name? The pitcher who started Studio 76 and then bankrupted oh, Kurt all of Rhode Island. Kurt Schilling, the bloody sock. Yeah, that guy. Uh, and then I remember I was living in Rhode Island at the time. The government was auctioning off like the desks. From where, like, their office yes. was and stuff, oh trying to God. make their yeah. $76 million, I think it was, or something like that, back. <laughs> uh, because they didn't make it back with that first game they launched. Kingdom of Amalur? Yeah, Kingdom of Amalur, Age of Reckoning. Yeah. And then, because they were working on an MMO in that same world. Uh, didn't do so well. Um, but regardless, the territory historically includes the islands of Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket. Today, there are two known Wampanoag tribes that are federally recognized. The, the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, uh, also known as Akina. The fortress played a huge role in Jesse. I feel like you're going to enjoy this little part of this, this story because it's the only historical part we're going to talk about here. This fortress played a key role in King Philip's War. Do you know much about King's, King Philip's War, Jesse? Was that a specialty of yours? I don't know what part of history you taught. No, it was not a specialty of mine. I barely know anything about that at all. To be honest. Ah, Well, I'll teach you a small bit here. Uh, This fortress played a huge role in King Philip's War as a strategic base of operations for King Philip, whose actual name was Medicom the Chief. He was the chief that they gave the name King Philip to. Interesting. So when you say King Philip or King Philip's War, it's actually referring to the chieftain of the Wampanoag. So it's like a mocking term? Almost, yeah. That's how I see it. Um, Hmm. I didn't read any huge history books for this part, just bits in here and there. Uh, but this is this. It's this like place, some dude being called the emperor. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Um, yeah. So yeah. this fortress they used within the swamp was extremely well defended because swamp like territory is hard to navigate in the first place. And during the 18th and 19th century, Euro American settlers deemed the swamp to be worthless, barren land, and attempted to drain it and convert it into a profitable farmland. Reverend and historian William L. Chafin of Easton was an early advocate of the drainage schemes. And guess what? I didn't fucking work. <laughs> they were not able to drain the swamp and have farmland on there. It is still a swamp to this day. Uh, that, However, the natives of the region placed a higher value on the swamp. For centuries, they'd relied on the swamp as a place to hunt game there, as many creatures would come to drink. And the swamp had gained a revered status among them. And they named it Hockamock, the Hockamock, the Algonquin term meaning place where spirits dwell. In addition to life-sustaining activities like hunting, much of the swamp served a dual purpose as a sacred burial ground. The Hockamock is occasionally referred to as the ho- uh, as the, the swamp of blood and, and wounds, I think. Um, the Wampanoag worshipped and feared the Habamock, which is a mysterious cryptid-like creature that lives there, uh, known as the chief deity of death and disease. So the Habamock lives, lives in the Hockamock, and the Habamock is the chief deity of death and disease. So that just so you, is yeah. an Elden Ring boss right there. <laughs> yes. I man, I bet you I fought a couple of those in that game. Yeah. Uh, Habamock composed of human souls of the dead, which were known to congregate in, in the areas like it. And thus the terms Hockamock and Habamock 
became interchangeable among non-natives when referring to the swamp or the spirit. So in a lot of times, just when it became part of the English knowledge and, and language, we just started swapping the two names. Um, in short, this place was primed basically to be a primo haunted zone. We're talking haunted hospitals, cryptids of all kinds, Thunderbird sightings, UFO sightings, murders, ritualistic a devil worshiping murders, puck wudgies, poltergeists, ghosts, and hell in the Bridgewater Triangle. Even Lizzie Borden's house resides within those barriers. <laughs> now we're not going to talk about Lizzie Borden in this episode because I lived in that. Like I lived very close to this, and I, Lizzie Borden was a huge part of just like growing up and having kind of like those like uh, the stories about like horror stories about like that kind of shit. Right. The real story of Lizzie Borden is fucking fascinating insane yeah. i will completely cover it one of these days moving forward i actually can't believe we haven't already that's like a huge one yeah yeah exactly thank you to canva for sponsoring today's episode and part of the job of being a podcaster as you've heard me talk about a bunch with canva because they're just really good at making this part of my job super easy is the visual stuff it's kind of like something I didn't think about when I started up the project. I knew I needed a logo, but that was it. And little did I know how much visual medium I would need to be creating to run a podcast. And not that I'm complaining, but as the podcast has grown, our time has gotten a little bit more valuable, shall we say. We don't have as much of it anymore. And uh, having Canva for Teams has been the way for us to be able to work on these visual mediums and having it accessible to all of our team, including our editor, both the boys and myself. And it's just made life so much easier. Canva for Teams is a design platform that makes it easy for anyone to create stunning content in any format from social media posts to videos, presentations, websites, you name it. The endless templates and premium fonts, photos, graphics, and videos add personality and edge to our team's content. And with features designed for brand consistency, Canva for Teams makes it easy to maintain your aesthetic and add your logos, fonts, and colors to anything that you create. Canva for Teams has a video editor that's so easy to use with tons of filters, animations, and transitions that'll bring your group's content to life. Seriously, it's so good for those social media little video snippets that we like to do. If this sounds like something you want to check out, all you got to do is collaborate with Canva for Teams. Right now, you can get a free 45-day extended trial when you go to canva.me slash chill. That's it. C-A-N-V-A dot M-E slash chill for a free 45-day extended trial. That's it. This is all you got to do. Canva.me slash chill. Thanks again to Canva for sponsoring the episode. But it's not, like I said, this place is a good horror, like origin point for haunting because of everything that's gone down there. And like we're talking a little bit of history starting in the 17th century with King, King Philip's War. What are the potential origin points of some of these hauntings if we're going to look at it as such? Specifically, the Hockamock Swamp, like being used as a fortress to defend against the encroaching settlements, used primarily as a center point to assault nearby English settlements. And King Philip's war was filled with some of the worst brutality I fucking ever read about in wars like this. Beyond the fact that it's considered one of the U.S.'s most devastating conflicts with an estimated one in 10 soldiers killed on both sides and 1,200 colonist homes burned to the ground. More interestingly, by the time King Philip's war truly started, an active conflict began. A huge portion of the Wampanoag people had already been killed off by what else? Smallpox, of course. And the colonists believed this would be a simple move in and take over scenario. They just used biological warfare first. And when they deemed most of them that were dead, they started to move in to try and take it over. But it wasn't as much as an easy win as they had hoped. And the Wampanoag people held them off for a long time. This war is also considered the bloodiest war per capita in U.S. history. To give just a small example of the kind of violence that occurred, we're talking limb removal as an extremely common way of killing people and torturing them. And when the Wampanoag people lost their chieftain, the guy, a guy who had been shot by a man called John Alderman, we learned that the guy who shot the Wampanoag chief was actually a Wampanoag per, uh, a man who switched sides because the, uh, the uh, religion kind of convinced him. And the Wampanoag people called him a praying Indian. Jeez. Because he kind of just switched over to um, the colonist side. And he was kind of working dual purpose. He shot the chieftain and he killed him. And the English decapitated the chieftain's corpse, jammed his now free mind, quote unquote. You like that? Was, I mean, uh, I don't a, know about that. 
on a pike and paraded it around their ta- like their villages, their uh, their colonists villages for a long for a few days until they decided on displaying the chieftain's head at the front of the fort where it sat for three fucking decades. Fuck. For 30 years. That is absolutely insidious. They cut a collection uh, of natives heads that they decapitated off their corpses that sat alongside it. They like just as part of a thing. So People they would come in and a spit fucking at traitor? it, swear at it, uh, all kinds of stuff. You know, the colonists would. Um, among many, like I said, among many of the other heads that they were decapitated by uh, from the natives. But their biggest trophy, and some believe the actual origin point of the haunting, is the missing wampum belt. So to put simply, a wampum belt is a belt that was created and display and that it was created and also displayed the history of their people in a visual medium. So you would like So it's literally like the entire everything of this entire tribe's history. Yeah. Yeah, you can Google wampum belts. There are other ones that are out there. Um, but to the, these people, uh, this was taken as a as a prize. Um, and while it was always worn by the chief, the belt was like a community thing. It was like it belonged to the community worn by the chief because he's just the head of the tribe. The belt itself would be sent back to Europe as a spoil of war. And after it went on the boat and left, it vanishes from history. It goes missing entirely. We don't know if it was lost at sea. We don't know if it made it all the way over to Europe and got lost somewhere over there. It's been gone. And over 400 years later, there are historians, archaeologists, and more still trying to track down that belt to this day. Articles as recent as 2022 uh, talking about people trying to still find this thing. And there's a large portion of people who believe that returning this belt where it belongs would finally end the centuries of haunting uh, that was that has been plaguing Bridgewater Triangle. If you know you want to hook it onto the mythology, like a Ghostbusters <laughs> type situation. Yeah, yeah, it's like a yeah, it's like the same closing point of the, the Hellmouth and Buffy. But it genu- but but genuinely the the it was taken and gone, and literally we don't know where it is. Nobody knows where it went, and it's not been found since. We have no fucking clue. Um, <clears throat> but even before <clears throat> this bloodiest war to occur on U.S. soil. The Hockamock Swamp was seen as a nearly sacred sacred place to the Wampanoag people, a place where they frequently hunted and placed, and I said, buried their dead. And not even that long ago, we're talking a couple years ago, if I remember correctly, archaeologists discovered more bodies in there that dated back somewhere about 8,000 years ago. Wait, what? what? That's like these, this place has been being used for thousands of years, just like dead people, like under the bog. And like just oh, tons of bodies deep, deep, deep down that people are still. They, and they they've carbon dated the body. Uh, I will have to find you the article I used. I will. 8,000 years. Excavation of the Hockamock and its immediate surrounding areas on the Taunton River produced very important archaeological findings dating back to the early archaic period of North America. The early archaic was approximately 9,000 to 8,000 BP, BP before present. Huh? Okay, I mean, I have to believe you then. Taylor Williams B, a, bi- a bifurcated point concentration, and the other source is history of the Titty Cut site, the wild Ooh. and scenic Taunton River. Don't you hate when that happens? From 2018. 8,000? Like, ooh, that's crazy, dude. Yeah, I, I, so I was like, that's when I read that. I was like, that's bananas. I have to put that in there. That's like impossible for me to even like ideate on like what was going on From over here. 1946. But couldn't 19- those just be like early humans getting caught in a swamp? Yeah, that's no, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's probably what it is. They don't really know. Like, if- okay, so there's nothing like this was the murder site for thousands of years. No, it's just more. I'm just saying more bodies are being found. Um, from 1946 to 1951, the Warren K. Moorhead chapter of the Massachusetts Archaeological Society worked under Director Maurice Robbins to unearth the Titty Cut site. The Titty Cut site, located along the Taunton River in Bridgewater, produced thousands of artifacts dirty, dating from the early Archaic to the Contact Period, 8600 to 400 BP before present, including hearths and pits, post molds, red paint, cer- ceremonial deposits, and a rectangular lodge floor. In addition to these examples of life at the time was the discovery of the Taunton River bifur- bifurcate arrowhead. Thirteen of these points used in hunting large game animals were discovered. And the Nankatusset River site, which runs from Lake Nipponicket through Hockamock Swamp, also produced bifurcated points, arrowheads from that time. Crazy. So it's just 
we forget how long people have been like living in what we now know as United United States well before it's crazy that we were like the new world. It's like, no, that shit was not new, bro. Yeah. A new world at all. Yeah. There's genuine history there. It's just like of thousands and thousands of years ago. It's inconceivable to me. It's hard. Yeah. It's really hard to wrap your mind around. I have no idea. Like I can't even place myself anywhere mentally near anything. What that would be like. It's so awesome. Yeah, it's it's I that's exactly how I walked away with. It's like a fantasy. It's like fantasy. It's like magical fantasy. It's like an un it, it's like an unimaginable time. It's crazy. Yeah. And so, as the centuries wore on, the Bridgewater Triangle would continue to see obviously death in the 70s and 80s in particular. In 1978, the body of a random teenager, Mary Lou Arruda, it was found tied to a tree in the forest. Uh, after four trials and a series of appeals, James Cater was found guilty of the murder and sentenced to life without parole. In 1979, satanic cult members murder, uh, murdered three young women involved in a Fall River prostitution ring. The bodies of two of the women were found elsewhere with their skulls crushed, their hands and legs lashed together, and only the muti- mutilated skull of the third victim was recovered. Police investigators located... Uh, locating evidence of devil worshiping activity at several locations in the forest, believe the victims were lured by the cult and slain in ritualistic sacrifice. We're going to talk way more about that in a little bit, but we're talking true devil worshiping people, not Satanists who are not remotely related to devil worshipers in any way. Satanists are the kind of more atheistic. Like take. We're talking about devil? people literally worshiping the devil. Yeah, like, like the devil worshipers are worshiping the actual devil in a way that like, they think they can conjure him into reality and trade their souls for amazing things. You know, they're, uh, that's what they were doing. Um, three cult members are later convicted of the murders of all that happened, uh, what happened there. In 1983, a healthy newborn male infant is abandoned in an area of the forest just off Route 24 and later dies from exposure. His parents are never identified. In 1987, a sled dog runner discovers the body of a Fall River drifter who was beaten. If you don't know what a drifter is, people who kind of hitchhike and are usually seen at like uh, truck stops and kind of travel around the country in such a a fashion. Not like a dude with like a sick whip. No, usually they're homeless, poor and, and, you know, uh, need more help than they're getting. So, yeah, they found beaten, shot three times and then set ablaze by four men who believed he was a police informant. Uh, This was in, in Freetown Police Chief. Carlton Abbott Jr., then a patrolman, responds and finds, quote, a grotesque scene. In 1988, two men are found naked and dead from shotgun wounds in a wooded area of of Dartmouth adjacent to the state land. The same year, the body of Elizabeth Gregory, buried in a remote forest cemetery after her death in 1868 at the age of 86, is stolen from her grave. Cult activity was suspected. And in 1991, an 18-year-old youth is stabbed, beaten, and left for dead during a drug deal gone or bad. His assailants steal his boots and bury him under leaves, but he's found alive after three days, and the victim suffers brain damage and frostbite, later losing both of his legs, and the police and state officials investigate an unrelated series of physical and sexual assault. This is a brief look. We're going to look at a couple more in greater detail later, but to give you an idea, yeah, that was from 1970 to 1990, just that handful of fucking crimes all got committed. It's like every year a new crime was happening in there, Uh, and it's really tough to know when we're kind of approaching this Bridgewater Triangle with such so many things to talk about, like where to start. But once we get going, don't be surprised when this starts to sound almost like a Chiluminati highlight reel. Everything that's happened in the swamp is something we've covered in some fashion. Then a surprising twist on the ultraviolence, the incredible amount of UFO encounters dating back as far as the 1760s, where the very first one on record that we have was a group of people in 1760 seeing a quote-unquote ball of fire. In fact, balls of fire are often seen in the sky by these people, but it's incredibly important to note that this particular instance that had been recorded, swamp gas might not be that far off from the truth, at least back then. And with the amount of corpses we learned are in that swamp and how long that swamp has been used uh, over the thousands of years, compounded with the methane created by rotting plants already in a swamp-like area, and you have an absolute 100% science-backed guarantee that there's going to be some sort of swamp gas. And that shit not only ignites, but in my research, I learned swamp gas can also cause you to hallucinate and trip balls, which is a, a, a reason more than one person has wandered out into the swamp to get themselves trapped and killed. 
Um, this huh. is something that happened often. You're talking, we're talking like sediment and methane coming together, bubbling up, hitting oxygen, and then. I hate when sediment and methane come together, man. Yeah. yeah. Like this is like a place where swamp gas actually is something to think about when seeing these, when reading about these 1760s. Yeah. The thing about swamp gas is that it's not a fake thing. It's just that it's a dumb excuse for most alien sightings. Yes. There are yeah. very specific points where it's it is a real, real serious, dangerous thing. You got to be careful of sometimes. Yeah, same yeah. thing with the excuse of ball lightning. Ball lightning is a true scientific thing that does and can happen. There's actual video. It, it of, has occurred. Yeah, it has occurred. But one sighting, the one sighting we're talking about in 1760s, interesting and maybe notable because it was seen by multiple people. A ball of fire that burned so bright, quote, it cast shadows in bright sunlight. And the sound it made was more audible during the middle of the burst of light than in the beginning. That's but that's really all we have of the sighting like that's that's all we know. And that doesn't really do much to deter swamp gas because everything in the 1760s that wasn't understood is God or witchcraft. So this is probably just swamp gas bubbling forward. Um, But sightings like this can be found and read about for centuries. I want to look at two in particular that occurred relatively close to each other. We have a lot of documentation on. And that were uh, what I consider the more credible UFO sightings here in the Bridgewater Triangle. And the very first one we're going to talk about is uh, in December of 1976 in Taunton, Massachusetts. Multiple drivers saw what they could only describe as two huge UFOs landing near Route 44. And sightings can be found and read about from 1973 all the way up to present day. And then in March of 1979, two men from the news station WHGH, saw another UFOs careening through the sky. The first one we're going to talk about, though, is October 1973, and is often considered one of the most credible UFO sightings we have ever documented. And the reason? It wasn't seen by civilians on the ground, or Grandpa Joe in the back drinking another Bud Light. It was seen by four men flying a military hot helicopter, which would then which would require them, all four of them, to be completely sober Moreover, they were seen as military men of impeccable character when journalists were asking people around them. And I'll read through it, and then I'm going to show you pictures. All four boys, the art, the, the government document they all signed, the pictures they drew for the government, and other things. Can't wait. It's, it's fucking crazy. The captain of this helicopter told his tale to a Cleveland reporter almost immediately, and subsequently relayed it to a national television audience on, Dick Cavett, on the Dick Cavett Show, to date, I don't know anything about the Dick Cavett show. I know nothing about it. I imagine it's a talk show. He ultimately made a report of his time in the sky over Charles Mill Lake to the United Nations. He told the Special Political Committee of the UN, quote, As a result of my experience, I am convinced this object was real and that these types of incidents should require a thorough investigation, end quote. The captain of the helicopter that night was Larry Coyne, and his name is often used as a reference to the event, which is known as the, quote, coin incident or the Mansfield encounter. I knew it as the Mansfield encounter. I had never heard it called the coins incident before. It was around 11 p.m. when the U.S. Army Reserve Huey passed over Richland County. Huey is in helicopter. Right. Passed over Richland County, flying from Columbus to Cleveland. There were four enlisted men aboard, and one of them casually mentioned to the captain that he could see a red light in the distance that was oddly out of place. Within moments, it became obvious to them that the odd light was in motion and that it was moving very quickly toward the helicopter on a collision course, which is a incredibly common report seen by pilots of both private and uh, public aircraft even to today. The captain took immediate evasive action, diving his craft out of the path of the unidentified object that was closing at a terrific speed. And suddenly, the object stopped still midair right in front of them, slightly above them. It cast a spotlight on them that was a brilliant green in color and paused for a moment to scan the army boys who were staring back wide eyed and amazed like the light kind of came on over them and then like hit the helicopter as a whole. And then without just as quickly as it arrived, it buzzed off over Mansfield. When the men in uniform stopped freaking out, they realized that their helicopter was 2000 feet higher in the sky than they ought to be. And that somehow during their encounter, the craft had lifted far above their normal flight path, even in spite of the evasive dive that the, helico- that the helicopter had undertaken. They needed to refuel, but they'd rather, uh, but rather than drop in at the Mansfield Air Base where they saw the aircraft head off to for a fill up as they had intended, they peeled out and went to Cleveland 
and arrived there with the gas gauge on empty. The pilot stated that he was, quote, so frightened that he wanted to leave that area immediately. One of the reasons why the Mansfield encounter remained so intriguing is because the sighting was corroborated on the ground as well. Driving along Route 430 that night, a mom and her kids were so astonished by the lights in the sky that they pulled over to watch. Commenting on the brilliant green illumination shining down around them, the mother said, quote, I don't know if I can describe the color of the light. It was real, real bright and absolutely beautiful. It was wonderful to see, but yet it was so frightening at the same time. I wanted the kids back in the car to get home as fast as possible. It scared me. So the, I'm gonna, first, I'm going to send you the art, the pieces, the article that were signed, all saying that like they all saw the same thing. They all kind of like are, are saying they saw the same thing. So that's their signature. The thing they all signed saying they all encountered the same exact thing. Okay. Lovely signatures. Yeah. It's like uh, yeah. The Declaration of Independence. <laughs> so the next thing is a kind of breakdown uh, length of obs- observation from a witness account done professionally by the government itself. And uh, if you can you can try and describe what you're seeing to everybody. It's like data. It's talking about kind of like it's kind of like a reenactment of the helicopter moving across the sky and kind of giving sort of like notes and kind of giving like a visual reference for how close ground witnesses were to the city, to the airport, elevation notes. And it looks like it just kind of goes in, dips down and then kind of zips up. At the very top, you have like the elapsed seconds that happened. You can see where their trajectory was going and how they somehow ended up 2000 feet higher um, over the town. And then the thing the last thing I sent you is a, is a, a drawing of the thing. And two of the men in the helicopter each independently sketched the UFO they saw. And both drawings are basically the same. They're basically exactly the same. So what you're seeing is a handcrafted, like, I guess you could call it maybe cigar shaped. It's hard to tell. It's like a, uh, it might be just your typical UFO. It's like, uh, circle. It's like, uh, one of those ones that has like rocket juice coming out the back. I don't know how yeah, to describe that, it. The, the, the juice is the green light though. That's right. Right. But it's like, there's this one type of alien craft drawing that you always see that, it looks like a joint, like it, like the cigar shape, the like flying cigar. Yeah, it's it's not really a cigar though. It's like more of a joint. Like I'm, you know what I mean? I I don't, but I in this case, looking at this, yeah. yes, yeah. this looks like a flying joint with green gas coming out the yeah. ass of it. <laughs> You're smoking it, and green, yeah, green herb juice yeah. is coming green out the back. Yeah. Now we're Good talking. Lord. Now we're now we're talking with weed. It's got a light, a constant green light. Yeah. Spewing out the back. It moves similar to a spotlight, only brighter. Yeah. But here's my problem, is that the constant bright red light in the front and the constant green light in the back has, like, man-made plane vibes to it. You know what I mean? Like, well, you gotta, you gotta be visible because you could hit it something. It is the two colors that airplane wings usually are. Yeah, it is. Uh, it, what, what would be undescribable is the way it moved. How it moved, the fact that it stopped dead in front of them, it hovered for a while. Uh, and it was so bright that even the people on the ground could see it. Like it was basking the people in the ground in green light. So either this plane has a hyper, hyper, hyper bright green light, or this plane was flying extremely close to the ground, or it's really good fucking camel- camouflage for people who look up in the sky and see something that might not rec- they might not recognize, but they see the green and red blinking lights and they just pass it off as a plane. Yeah, you're right. I mean, look. I didn't see this. Yeah, I, this is a drawing. But yeah, regardless, we have the paperwork. It was reported to the government. The four guys all signed on and said the same thing. We have, you know, as good of evidence as this actually happened. Looks like a joint to me. Yeah, it looks like a little bit of a joint to me, too, now that you mention it. It didn't click with me as a joint at the time, but I was in, it was an alien world, so, you know, I wasn't really thinking about it. I get it. Um, but that's, like, the best UFO encounter we have from that area. I want to move on now from the UFO encounters to cryptid encounters. One particular cryptid, specifically, that is often found in Hockamock we, Swamp. We talk about my man, the Puck Wudgie? No, we talked <laughs> about him before, but we, we will talk about him briefly. Um, no, we're talking about the the thick, we're going to nestle ourselves oh. in the thick, comfy fur of the Hockamock Swamp monster. Okay, all right. Which is, perhaps as you're imagining, a Bigfoot-like ape, but closer like swamp to thing what vibes? people describe as like the swamp ape of Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got a, a consistent stink. That kind of follows like it around. a gnarly, you know? sort of nasty boy. Nasty, gnarly boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Man thing, swamp thing vibes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. One of the most well-known sightings of the Hockamock Swamp Monster occurred in 1972 when a group of teenagers were hiking in the area. The teenagers reported seeing a large, hairy creature that was standing on its hind legs that looked at least seven feet tall. 
The creature reportedly stared at the teenagers for a few moments before taking off and disappearing into the woods. Another notable sighting of the Hockamock Swamp Monster occurred in 1975 when a police officer was on patrol in the area. The police officer reported seeing a large, dark creature that was running across the road. The creature reportedly stopped and looked at the police officer before, much like the teenage boys, within moments, turning off and walking and disappearing into the woods. There have been numerous sighting, other sightings of the Hockamock Swamp Monster reported over the years. Some witnesses have described seeing the creature walking on two legs, while others have reported seeing it running on all fours. The creature has also been described as having a variety of different features, including large eyes, sharp teeth, and very long claws. And obviously, there's no scientific evidence to support the existence of the Hockamock Swamp Monster, just lots and lots of, support, uh, of stories. On November 6, 1976, a group of four paran- uh, a group of four hunters, not paranormal hunters, regular hunters, were hunting deer in the Hockamock Swamp. The hunters were split into two pairs, with each pair hunting a different section of the swamp. At around 10 a.m., one of the pair of hunters, consisting of a man named Jim and his son, heard a loud noise coming from the woods. They turned around, and what they saw was a large, hairy creature standing up on its hind legs, somewhere about eight feet tall, they recalled, and it had a thick coat of dark fur. Jim and his son were startled and took off, but the creature reportedly ended up following them for a short distance before turning off, breaking away, and disappearing into the woods. Like they felt threatened? Yeah, they were running from it. They were scared, and they thought it was chasing them. And then, but then it may be like any wild animal, if it deems it you were no longer a threat, it probably just broke away and broke off. The other pair of hunters who were located about a quarter mile away from where they were also heard the noise and saw the creature and they too ran away. But that creature didn't follow them. The hunters reported the the site to the police who investigated the area, but found no evidence. And however, the hunter's account was corroborated by several other witnesses in the area, including a man who said he saw the creature crossing the road while he was driving home from work. One thing we learned about the Hockamock Swamp there is always cross. He's a Hockamock swamp monster he's always crossing the street what's that about i was just blaming on uh we're, we're we're moving into his land this is his place he's got a he, so you're you think he's he, he's just like a like a fucking he has like a he's like shrek he's shrek in the swamp get out of his fucking swamp so he's just stepping on the road to like scare the shit out of people he's like yeah, he's asserting his alphaness he's asserting his alphaness that's fucked up <laughs> okay in 1976, so I can't believe nobody hits him. Another 1976 site, or rather, the 1976 sighting of the Hockamock Swamp Monster is another one of the more well known ones, along with the June 20th, 1980 sighting by a woman named Mary who was sitting on her porch in Taunton, Massachusetts, when she saw a large, dark creature, what else, run across her yard. The creature was reportedly about seven feet tall, thick coat of fur that was very dark. And uh, Mary was startled and ran inside their house, but the creature reportedly continued running across the yard and then disappeared into the woods. So apparently just like it ran across, I guess the yard was really big. She got really scared and ran inside and watched it from the outside. It didn't seem to care that she ran away because it just kept darting across the yard and disappearing into the swamp. When you say dart, I imagine it's like, (laughs) you know, it's got arms up. We're talking like a hundred miles an hour or like the speed of a man. Probably the speed of a man, maybe a little faster. Okay. You know, he's got a large gait, you know, he's seven or eight feet tall. What? What? Why are you shaking your head at this, Pussy? <laughs> I just, I, I'm, I'm listening. What do you want me to say? <laughs> I don't know. I think What's this on your is mind? BS, What's like, like, like always. Hey, 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 this is, this what do you want me to do? This is, this I'm is, listening. Well, listen, fine. We'll move away. We'll move away from the Hockamock Swamp Monster. We'll talk a little bit more about the, the red eyed oh. dog. That sleeps and sends in Bridgewater Triangle. Now, that is a Goosebumps book. In 1973, a group of teenagers were camping in the Hockamock Swamp, which I don't know why you would do that. That sounds like a terrible idea. And they were when they were awakened by a strange noise, the teenagers got out of their tent and saw a large black dog with bright red eyes standing in the clearing nearby. The creature was reportedly about, <laughs> and this is going to be funny, like six feet tall if it was to stand on its hind legs also with thick fur and uh very dark fur but it wasn't uh but it was on all fours it wasn't standing tall the teenagers were startled ran back to their tent but the creature reportedly followed them and hung out outside their tent for several minutes waiting for them and after a few minutes this like went by and they did not leave their tent they could hear it leave off into the woods and the crunching foliage until it was gone 
The teenager's story was obviously met with skepticism, but corroborated by another witness who was also camping in the area that night where he saw the same creature running through the woods and that its red eyes were glowing in the dark. The sighting of a giant red eyed dog is one of the more like bizarre cases and less common ones out here. But there are a couple people that like saw it and believe there's a red eyed dog. Nobody got a gun and shot it. So I have no idea if it's the same wolf from Skinwalker Ranch. But it'd be cool if there was if it was. That is hardcore. That's like a fucking horror movie encounter. Now we'll talk quickly about puck wedgies. Yeah. Puck wedgies are also known to be in the Bridgewater Triangle. And our very first live show we ever did, this is what we were talking about. So for those who don't know, we're just going to give you a brief overview of what the puck wedgie is. <laughs> there I was on stage, my <laughs> knees slicked with beer and piss. <laughs> According to legend, puck wedgies can appear and disappear at will. Shapeshift, of which the most common form is a creature that kind of looks like a porcupine with uh, from the back and like a troll and slash human from the front. It's there and it lures people to their death, uses magic, launches poison arrows and likes to create fire. Uh, Native Americans believe that puckwudgies were once friendly to humans, but then turned against them and are best left alone. According to lore, a person who annoyed a puckwudgie would be subject to nasty tricks by it or subject to being uh, followed by the puckwudgie who would cause trouble for them. They're known to kidnap people, push them off of cliffs, attack their victims with short knives and spheres, and use sand to blind their victims. They got pocket sand. Spears. They got spears and pocket sand, dude. What is they a sphere? Wait, hold like, on. Hey, huh. What the fuck is a sphere, dude? What is a sphere? It's a tiny spear because they're tiny. Oh, a spear, dude. I thought you were saying sphere. Spear. I was like, what is that? What are they doing? Knives like- and spears. Yeah, okay. I'm with you now. Puck wedgies are said to be the enemies of cultural culture heroes, the giant Mao shop and his wife, Granny Squanit, another. And one story from Wonkin, Wonk, we're not going to talk, we can't talk about all this stuff right now. We're going to have to blast by it. But one day we'll talk more about Canonically, it. Canonically, these things are level one monsters and they give you five EXP. Period. Yeah, very much. That's exactly what they are. They're there to annoy you. And if they kill you, it's because you weren't paying attention. He pushed you off a cliff. Yeah. <laughs> So they're heroes to like a few native like uh, kind of uh, mythological uh, people. One story from Wampanoag folklore explain, explains that they began causing mischief and tormenting the natives out of jealousy of the devotion and affection the natives had for Mao Shop, who eventually exiled them to different parts of North America. The Pukwudgies have since been hostile to humans and took revenge by killing Mao Shop's five sons. Some variations even suggest that they had killed Mao Shop himself. I know a lot of detail there, but you can go read it up on it. We don't have the time to cover it. We got to keep moving. It's vibes. I love the puck wood. It's off. The, and so far, this has been mostly fantastical, right? It's, it's been a just, lot of fun. There's even Thunderbird sightings out there. People have seen what they consider the Quasicoddle swooping down, which we talked about. We may have even talked about one of the sightings in our Thunderbird episode that we did like a year or two ago at this point. A long time ago. Yeah. A lot, a lot of fun, just kind of cool cryptid stuff. A weird, a weird red eyed dog. It really is just kind of like a Skinwalker Ranch esque. Yeah. Almost like a cartoon setting. Very much. Gravity Falls type vibe. Cartoon setting, Gravity Falls is exactly what it yeah. is. You're absolutely it's correct. Like a, it's like a 80s uh, kids on bicycles tabletop game called Kids, kids on, on bikes. bikes. Yeah. Tales from the Loop. And kids on Bikes. Yeah. Tales from the Loop. Kids on Bikes. Yeah. 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 yeah very much. It's fun. Laughs. Crazy cryptids. Feels like we're actually almost done with the Bridgewater t- Triangle kind of, doesn't it? Except we're not. Oh. And the worst shit to ever occur within the Bridgewater Triangle isn't even paranormal to begin it's with. It's going to be like a fucking mental hospital or something, isn't it? Oh, you are. Just wait. No, the Bridgewater Triangle is a hot spot for something much, much worse and much more real. Ho- real, horrible murder, torture, satanic ritual killings, prisons, mental asylums, schools <laughs> schools and you know rainbows and ponies obviously there's a school in there you say it, it got, it got a last. bomb threat like oh not no too long ago. yeah i know i never had that happen in school when i was in school did you it happened to me in college a couple times where it was like active shooter on campus but uh other than that nope okay well never had that uh, either. mine was mine was jewel thieves oh which was kind of wild that's why yeah, that's a weird thing yeah yes yeah, as recent as 2015 some of the most heinous killings I've read about have occurred within this area. For instance, Julian Squires, 48, of Manchester, New Hampshire, was convicted by a jury of a 10-day trial of one count each of murder and kidnapping and the death of 29-year-old New Jersey resident Ashley Bortner in November 2015. 
The DA's office said more than 70% of Bortner's body was burned when police found her bound, gagged, and still on fire beside the MBTA train tracks in Bridgewater on November 3rd of 2015. Another woman was trapped, tied up, and tortured in her own home for over a month before the police found out she was being discovered. Fuck. The body of a missing girl was found months later, tied to a tree, decapitated with her head, sat on the ground beside her, only able to identify her through dental records. I thought this was supposed to be the fun episode. What the hell? Oh, but this is the shit that actually happens out there. He just wanted to leave us on a bad note, basically. <laughs> not, not quite. Not quite. Don't worry. Another story of, of a familiar tactic. A serial rapist would dress up as a state trooper and approach unsuspecting teens and adults, accusing them of doing something they weren't supposed to, yelling and demanding that they get into his car lest they'd be in more trouble. And of course, many teenagers, especially in pure panic and worried about being in trouble with the law, they did exactly what they asked him to. And after they would get in the car and they were locked in, handcuffed, the man would drive off where they would ultimately meet their true fate with him. And the, the sick part is this guy was on the run for years. The cops couldn't find him. This is just like another message. Like if you're listening to this podcast, please, unless you see a badge or you know certainly who this person is and that they're a cop, don't fucking listen to anybody. Don't get into their car. Don't trust anyone. You have to like anybody can pretend to be anything out there, especially in the middle of the woods. Just be very careful. Because, again, this is not even that long ago. Like this is like, I mean, be very careful in the woods. I, everybody could take that advice. Yeah, be careful in the woods. The, then there were the West Bridgewater ritual murders, which is a term that was used to refer to the murders of David Lucier and M Robin Mowry, two teenagers who were found stabbed to death in the woods of West Bridgewater, Massachusetts in 1984. The murders were later linked to a group of teenagers who were involved in devil worship. So they're not Satanists, they're devil worshiping. And they were killing people, offering as sacrifices to do this, whatever, to invoke some heinous power that the devil would give them, which obviously never fucking We got to do like a episode called Devil Worship versus Satanism. Yeah. Because you've dropped multiple times in this episode. They're very different. Let's get our boy. You know that, let's right? Get our boy I don't think many on. people do. I don't No, I genuinely don't think many people do, which is why I'm, I'm trying to point it out. Cause and I would love to have that conversation just in general. If we could get a guest. Airdorf, let's bring him back on. That like the the church that like Satanists use that as almost like a jibe at current religion and God, right? They don't actually worship Satan. Yeah, it's like ironic. Yeah, it's an ironic thing that they can use to try and leverage the law that's so often in the in favor of like Catholics or Christian stuff in their favor. They like they're pro abortion. It's to show the hypocrisy. Yeah, yeah, it's there to show the hypocrisy, and their tenets are all about being kind to other people, being kind to yourself. And taking care of yourself and keeping healthy. Right. Okay. But like, which one do you think the devil likes more? Which one do you think Satan's cool with? If Satan was real, if Satan was real, there's an argument to be made. The man only gave us critical thinking. Look, there's a lot of arguments <laughs> to be made about, about like. Dude, don't say things like Satan gave us critical thinking. Okay. Yeah. We're already, you're already like, we're already down that rabbit. I know. I All know. I'm saying is we need an episode uh, because it sounds like that's going to be. A hot button one, one that's going to get a lot of people popping off with a lot of thoughts. And I would love to be involved with that. everybody. And that's the thing that everybody's satanic belief into who he is and what he's able to do is slightly different. That's because most of it's made up from Milton. Satan is less real than God, I would say. Like Satan is the most fuckable super like natural. That's not what where my head was about? at. That's not where what my head was at. Why? I've got to say that's is not like where my head was at. Long hair, not even pack. remotely, Alex. I'm with you on this. I don't know what <laughs> happened. I gotta admit, I wasn't thinking about that. I was not thinking about having sex with Satan. No, not just you know, it was like there's a statue that some art artist made long ago that is like like the most beautiful angel falling from heaven because it's like that's supposed to be Satan. He's supposed to be tempting. Yes. And like, you know, like he's supposed to pull you. No, I, like we get and it. You were like, fuck yeah. But you were like, <laughs> I want to have sex with that. <laughs> I mean, I guess I, I would. You, I'd bang Satan. You are wildin', sir. Because then at least he's real and I know he's real. You are wildin'. Is that Satanism or is that devil worship? That's Ooh. devil worship, probably. I think you would be devil worshiping if you know what I'm saying. I think you, oh, you know, oh, you know what? You're right. I'd be worshiping like nobody worshipped him before. <laughs> what is the matter with you? Nothing. Saddam Hussein <laughs> from the South Park movie. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> oh, my God. If Satan were real and he took me into his loving embrace, my mouth would never be empty for him.
You got it? I just don't know why that's where you're at right now. That's where you brought me. No one brought you there. Not five minutes ago, we're like, the decapitated bodies were found Nobody in the brought woods. And now you're like, I banged the devil, though. You brought yourself Wait, there. What happened? Look down. There's only one set of footprints down there. Having an episode on Satanism versus des- devil worship would be really good. I do think that would be good. Thank you. Yes. That's the point. Is I think that would be a fascinating episode. Erdorf. Erdorf isn't a Satanist. I know, but he's 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 he, we did, he did Satan last time he was on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We did the satanic panic, yeah. which uh, I need to recover one day in a much deeper way because of the real leader of the satanic panic, Mike Warnke. Dude, uh, dude what a, that's ooh, a whole yeah. situation. Yeah, exactly. I can't wait to talk about him one day. So back to the terrible murders. Uh, the investigation of the murders lo- led police to the group of teenagers. The teenagers who were between the ages of 14 and 17 admitted admitted to the cops to planning and carrying out the murders. They said that they had killed Lucier and Mowry as a sacrifice to the devil. The teenagers were arrested and charged with the murders, and they were all convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Is that prison what you were afterward. doing that night in the graveyard, Mathis? <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget. Dude, I farted all over that dude's hand. What? I was so nervous. Okay. I was being patted down by cops, and I couldn't control my anxiety, and I was just very pooty. What? I got it. We need to have an episode called How Mathis's Brain Works. What do you mean? We're like, we get a person in to like. He's referring just... to the time I was in a graveyard yeah. with my then, now ex, then girlfriend, and my be- my best friend at the time, Scott. Yeah, yeah. Because we were, there was a walking path in the graveyard. No, no, we get what he's referring to. You just said. You heard about it, and then you were like. That's the thing I remember the most. Straight to fart hand. Yeah. Like... I remember being so scared, I farted all over him. <laughs> I was so nervous. I don't have to write it. It just happens. Here, here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'm going to do an episode that I'm just going to ask Mathis like reasonable questions, <laughs> and we're just going to see where it goes. That'll be on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will ask him non like unreasonable questions, yeah. and we'll see where it goes. <laughs> that's just that's just a history of me that actually happened. It's not even a story. I'm just going to marry Boff Kill with inanimate objects, Mathis. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Moving on. Then, of course, away from the murders... There is the Taunton State Hospital, which is a a psychiatric hospital located on Hodges Avenue in Taunton, Massachusetts. It was established in 1854 and originally known so nicely as the State Lunatic Hospital at Taunton. I just like I forget like back then they just fucking psycho house like care for mental health. Yeah, the the crazy person home. Send them the New England booby hatch. Um, This place got huge over the years. The complex was expanded at various times to include over 40 buildings and structures. The main part of the hospital, known as the Kirkbride Building, closed in 1975, and the buildings very quickly began falling into disrepair. In 1994, the property was then added to the National Register of Historic Places as a historic district. And in 1999, the main dome of the administrative building finally collapsed. Uh, So, like, this place was, like, kind of just left after 1975 to kind of rot away. And in 1851, going back to kind of the beginning of it all, the Massachusetts General Court appointed a commission to find a site for a new asylum to relieve the pressure of rising patient populations from its only facility out in Worcester, Mass. The new facility in Taunton, that's when this facility to Taunton opened in April of uh, 1854. The large sprawling campus located on a hill offered fresh air and sunlight following Kirkbride's concept for treating mental health patients. That, that kind of reminds me of, like, trying to treat tuberculosis by having them head up to, like, high mountain homes and breathe the mountain air because somehow that helped. I remember that being a treatment back then. Uh, the complex was expanded in the early 1870s, again in 1887 and again in 1906. And from the 1930s, juvenile facilities, crisis centers, sick wards, and group homes were all added. One of the building's most beautiful features was its breezeways, which were added in the 1890s to connect the end of the wards to the hospital infirmary buildings. Its district cupolas, cup, the dis, its district cupolas, large dome, cast iron capitals, and window bars gave the building its very own unusual, creepy, and in my opinion, gothic kind of atmosphere that hangs over it. I remember a bunch of my friends when I was young went went and like ghost hunted this place multiple times, and I was like 11, and I was too scared to go. Um, even though like my cousins were like older teens, I was just like afraid I was going to like fall through a broken floor and die. And that's honestly probably not necessarily a bad thing to worry about. It's a deteriorating building. An 11 year old probably shouldn't be going into that. <laughs> so I may have missed my one and only t- t- a chance to ghost hunt when I was a kid, but I lived because of it. <laughs> On June 10th, 1992, 
Two patients at the Taunton Taunton State Hospital, David Choquette and James McGinn, were both found dead in their beds. Both patients had been strangled to death, and the investigation into the murders led police to John Geohan. Geohan? 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 It's, It's Irish for sure. A patient at the hospital who had a history of violence. He was arrested in charge of the murders and was later convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to two life terms in prison. And he was known to be involved in satanic worship. And some believe that the murders may have been part of a ritual that he was trying to do some sort of like what devil worship in the actual hospital. And during his trial, he actually claimed that he was, quote, possessed by the devil at the time of the murder. So his lawyers were like, we're going with this, bro. Yep. They were just yeah. like, just go with it. It's all you got. Just go. He also claimed that he had been instructed by the devil to kill the two patients, which makes no sense. Were you possessed by the devil to do the murders or did the devil tell you to do the murders? You can't really have both, right? Like if the devil's possessing you, you don't really have control of yourself, right? Am I wrong in in seeing the faulty logic out the gate? It's like video games. Like, I don't know, like rules. I don't know. This is, I don't know. This is the mysteries of the devil, bro. I I can't, I can't. Yeah. Well, luckily, the judge said there was no evidence to support his claims that he was ever possessed by the devil, and he died in prison in 2003. Then there's the Taunton State Hospital murders, which is a tragic and disturbing case where the murders uh, are a reminder of the dangerous uh, of uh, not treating the mentally ill properly, the importance of providing adequate care for them. And the case also serves as a reminder of the of the like just like the mess that this hospital was even during its like peak running times. Not a lot of care was given to these patients. So on, um, yeah. So uh, this particular murder uh, was another strangulation murder on this one. However, there wasn't any claim that there was devil worship. It was just somebody who got extremely angry at somebody else, waited for them to go to sleep and then just strangled them to death in their sleep. Just a good old me- premeditated, horrific murder. One of the worst ways you can kill someone probably trauma list, like the most, Horrific thing I can imagine. Just somebody getting mad at somebody we're else. We're not going to end on. We're not going to end on murders. Like fuck. Murders lead to hauntings, and the Bridgewater Triangle is home to some of the people claim some of the most well-known hauntings in New England. Um, one of the most common types of paranormal activity reported is within the, in the Taunton State Mental Hospital. It's simply disembodied voices. You're very classic. You walk in, you can hear. Uh, You know, like that kind of stuff. Was that you finally getting fucked by a ghost? <laughs> no. That sounded like you finally getting fucked by a ghost. Uh, no. <laughs> whoa. You know what? Pea soup shooting Ooh. everywhere and shit. <laughs> on me that's gonna unfound not, not what i was going for but maybe it's just my own subconscious knows what i want from all maybe. things paranormal i think everybody's actual conscious knows what you want at this point <laughs> I, listen i don't you know what we can't get into it right now i can't i can't defend myself in this moment we've got to keep moving <laughs> apparitions are also commonly reported at the taunton state hospital visitors and staff members reported seeing apparitions of former patients and former staff members the apparitions are often described as being transparent or translucent and they sometimes seen walking through the hallways, standing in the doorways, or sitting in the chairs. There you go. They're just hanging out, standing in a doorway, or sitting in a random chair. I think that's creepier to me. I'd rather have, like, see something dart by than just see some dude sitting in a fucking chair. And then if I look away and look back, he's gone. That would be way scarier for me. Beyond the typical hauntings, you also have poltergeist activity that happens here. Visitors and, and, and whatnot report seeing objects moving on their own Pieces of, like, debris flying across the hallway, doors opening and closing by themselves, lights turning on and off. And one of the more famous stories of paranormal activity in the Taunton State Hospital is the story in the haunting of the nurse's station. The nurse's station is a room on the second floor of the hospital where nurses used to sit and monitor patients. The nurse's station is known for its disembodied voices, apparitions, and poltergeist activity. Visitors and staff members often he- reported hearing your typical voices whispering, calling out names, or even speaking complete sentences. The voices are usually described as being mournful or distressed, which is why I was like, you know, oh, but that's a mournful moan. There's, there's lots of kinds of distressed. That's a mournful moan? Yeah, you know, I'm mournful because I'm a dead person in a mental hospital. Oh, 
Oh! That was supposed to be like a banging on the door kind of thing, but I couldn't. I, you yeah, know, I couldn't sure, get it a... sounded like banging, all right. Oh! I... I love... Boobs. <laughs> do, you, do you think the ghost is willingly participating in whatever it is I'm doing? I fucking hope so, man. Me too. I, I don't want to do it unless they're willing. I don't want, like, you know. That's good. You know? It's a That's ghost. Good. The reason a ghost is somebody I would sleep with is because the ghost could literally be anybody. Not technically alive. Not, well, okay, true. No pregnancy risk. I think people should come to our live show December 3rd and do their best ghost impressions for us. Oh, moaning ghost impressions. Oops. Apparitions are also commonly reported out in the nurse's station. Uh, the apparitions are often described as being, you know, the like typical transparent translucent wearing nurses attire uh, from especially the olden time, like that old school, like white, long kind of gown with that little white hat on top. Poltergeist uh, beyond things being thrown around. Um, we also have the stories of shadow people, which is another very common thing in a, in a haunting where, oh, my God. I just remembered I had a really fucking weird encounter in my house the other day. And I need, we almost missed it's it. Haunting. We almost missed it. Let's hit it. Oh my god! It was a. It was we the reason it reminded me the episode without hearing about it is because it just reminds me of like a shadow thing. So I was going to bed, and in my in the master bedroom, there's like the door that leads directly to the bathroom, and light master was on. The bedroom. Look at Johnny Richmond over here. <laughs> he just, no, just yeah, yeah, he just doesn't live in California. Yeah. Master bedroom. Okay. <laughs> and the, the bathroom is right there. The door was shut, and the light was on. And I, you know, I usually accidentally leave the light on a bunch. And I was heading over to go turn it off. And as I was walking under the door where you very clearly can see the light, a shadow that's maybe like four or five inches long doesn't dart, but just kind of strolls across like a a very not questionable fucking shadow. My immediate thought was, oh, my God, do I have a fucking mouse, rat, whatever? So I open the door instantly. I don't I'm not like running away. And when I go in there, there's nothing. There's no, I'm looking around for like maybe droppings of like mouse poo or something under the cabinets. You know, it's not like a mess that they can go hide into when you walk in. Just a a empty, clean bathtub on your left and the sink and your uh, faucet on the right. And then the hallway that leads down to a toilet and that's in behind a door. But that's too far away from where the thing was. What if the mouse used the toilet, dude? Maybe it did. Uh, Maybe it fucking did. But dude, there was nothing. There was no noise. It was no like no noise. Fucking nothing. It was just a shadow that moved across the bottom of my door. No idea. May, I'm hoping it was something. I don't, don't you know. Have pets though. Yeah, but none of them were in the bathroom. The door was shut. It must be a ghost. It must be. There's nothing else it could be. I don't know what. I'm not saying it was a ghost. I'm just saying I know it wasn't my shadow cats. person. Nothing else it could be. I'm just saying. Anyway, so shadow people. Thank you. So you know, uh, audience, tell me what I saw. It, they're going to tell me it was like a possum or something. I'm sure. Visitors and staff members uh, beyond seeing that. Um, nurse's station has also been investigated by numerous paranormal groups. The investigators have often captured evidence of the paranormal activity that includes EVPs, which is an electronic voice phenomena, EMF readings. Uh, and in one investigation, a group of paranormal investigators captured an EVP of a woman's voice sounds like saying, help me. And another one of a man's voice going, get out. Very typical. In another investigation, a group of paranormal investigators captured an EMF reading of over 10 point uh, over 10 milligauss in the nurse's station. An EMF reading of over 10 milligauss is considered to be anomalous and is often con- associated with paranormal activity. But I want to interject here as well and say EMF is sure. real. It's a very real thing. But high EMF can cause you to hallucinate, can give you headaches, can cause you to see things that aren't actually there. So if there is high AMF reading in the nurse's station, it's possible there's some faulty wiring somewhere or old wiring that's causing a lot of like EMF to kind of leak out. Uh, and it can cause you to have like fucked up, like not like super mega sick, but you can hallucinate slightly on it and stuff. Then there's a solitary confinement cell, a small dark room where patients who were considered to be dangerous were kept. And in the solitary confinement cell, it's known for screams, cries and disturbing noises. Visitors and staff members have reported hearing screams coming from the solitary confinement cell, even though the cell has been empty for years. One visitor reported hearing the sound of a man screaming in agony. Another visitor reported hearing the sound of a woman crying uncontrollably. Visitors and staff members have also reported seeing apparitions in the solitary confinement cell, with one visitor reported seeing the apparition of a man standing in the doorway of the cell nonchalantly. Oh, chill. Another visitor reported seeing, yeah, like a chill dude just kind of leaning in the door. Like, what up? Hey, how's it going? 
Another visitor reports seeing the apparition of a woman inside the cell itself, banging on the walls of the cell. Hey! And not my kind of banging. Aggressive Not banging. my kind of banging. You just walk into everything. You were like, and not my kind of banging. Aggressive banging. Boops. I know where your minds are at. I know where you're at. I'm here. I'm going to keep you in line. Stay in your My lane. mind wasn't there. Stay in your I lane. I wasn't thinking about sex either. And he went out of the way to make sure that we know... That his type of banging is not aggressive. He dragged us to where he was at. Uh, and then you got the story of the of the moving bed. Visitors and staff members have reported seeing the, a bed in a cell move on its own multiple times. Fully across the room, spinning around in circles, and even once seeing it floating in the fucking air. Another story of the, of the, is, uh, the story of the quote unquote chains. Visitors uh, and staff members have reported hearing the sound of chains dragging on the floor in the cell. The chains have also been seen materializing and dematerializing in front of witnesses. Like, that's, that you never see. Usually you look away and the ghost is gone. But people apparently have seen them like... Wait, like like when you kill a vampire in Blade? Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they, ah, they turn to a skeleton. Yeah, I don't know what they mean by dematerialize. Like, dematerialize, they don't give a description. Like Thanos? Yeah, that's yeah. all like exactly. It's like what I'm thinking. Of. All right. Um, again, this place has been investigated multiple times. Uh, in in one investigation, a group of paranormal investigators captured an EVP of a man's voice saying, "Please let me out. I'm scared." Yikes! That's that's the worst. The highest EMF reading they've gotten there is 20 milligauss, which is pretty fucking high. Um, and that is the end of the most hauntings. Again, you're kind of getting the usual style of hauntings there. Nothing crazy. Uh, but I, I, I like to tie it to the murders because how much fucking death fucking keeps happening here. Now, if we were to look at a realistic reason that murders keep happening in Hockamock Swamp, it's simply because it's a fucking swamp. Anybody who knows and lives in the fucking area who has nefarious deeds in mind and violent tendencies knew that the place to fucking go was Hockamock Swamp in the Bridgewater Triangle because people have, like, if there are crimes where the bodies still haven't been found. They're still out there somewhere. because 8,000-year-old crimes, apparently. And I believe even the Boston Stranglers use this area to dump their bodies very oh often when we, when we talk about them one day. Um, and that, you know, beyond the, the mythical, magical hauntings of it all, this place is, in, there are plenty of articles with the city, uh, with city officials talking about how they wish this place didn't have such a negative reputation because they believe the ne- negative reputation draws more negative actions. Copycat killers or people who have maybe been thinking about doing something for a long time and then they saw some, maybe somebody do it and get away with it in the Hockamock Swamp or read about it. And it kind of just draws those people there. And I'm not necessarily, I, I think that's correct. I think a lot of the reasons a lot of crimes happen here is because it's just a place where you're likely going to be able, at least back in the 70s, when there wasn't cell phones and stuff, you could get away with it. The swamp was going to do all the dirty work for you. I mean, we've talked about plenty of true crime killers who have used swamps to let their bodies just get to deca- like decompose quickly on their own. Um, that makes more sense to me. I can't, however, describe the UFOs, the big dog, the giant ape. Well, we did say it was one of the places where there actually is a legit swamp gas situation it is yeah 100 percent. it's the it's the helicopter or ufo sighting that sticks with me the most. Uh, yeah i mean that one's yeah that one's not quite like but that. in the yeah. end what you believe is real or not is wholly up to you there's no physical evidence that any of these paranormal things happen beyond maybe a footprint somewhere that someone believes belong to the hockamock swamp monster we do know the murders are real and that's kind of enough to be careful out there and especially yeah and it certainly captures the imagination like i definitely yeah. like we were saying before it just really feels like a place it does like a like a setting you know what i mean there's even like we i mean there's so many things out there there's like a rock out there that has all kinds of etchings on it that people don't know what it means i remember i almost like a bunch of my friends would go climbing on that rock a bunch of times over in that area prospect rock and they're all dead now isn't that where chris jericho went was the bridgewater triangle did he? I don't know anything about wrestling. When I was showing you guys, I can't remember. Maybe he did. He, I can't remember. I, actually, no, you may be right. You think you yeah. did say that. Um, yeah, it's a real place, and it's a place that if you live nearby, there's, it's such a big area. Again, 200 square miles that, it, of course, if you cast a big enough net, you're going to have a lot of similarities, like especially with the crimes and stuff. But that, boys, is the quick and dirty breakdown Wild. of the tales of the Bridgewater Triangle, both imagined and real. Some horrifying, some titillating, others just plain confusing. <laughs> Vibes. And that's it for us today. We're, 
Uh, thank you guys, everybody, over at patreon.com slash IlluminatiPod for supporting the show. We're off to go do a mini-sode for that uh, specific site right now. And again, a reminder, if you did not get to see the October show, even if you're coming to the December show, grab the show over at patreon.com slash IlluminatiPod. Everybody who's a patron of the $5 tier and up. Two completely different shows with tons of surprises in store for the December one. We're really doing this show up big for as because it's in December, so we'll see. And if you're not a member of the patron, you still head over to patreon.com slash Illuminati Pod and you can buy the whole bundle for five bucks. And you get the digital, you get the audio, the video, and the digital poster all tied together. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you. We love you, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by the... I don't know who they are. There's two. One. Terrence Hill and Bud Spencer. No. Neo and Trinity. No. I don't understand, and I probably never will. Let me just tell you right now that there's two. Leon Kennedy and Claire Redfield. I'm telling you, I think he literally just looked up famous duos. Cheech and Chong. And it's been going through the list ever since. I'm trying to dig deep. One of you is uh, Dick Powell. Me? Your name's Jesse Cox. <laughs> I want to love you. I want my my baby. I want to love you. I want my my Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Illuminati Podcast. As always, I'm one of your hosts, Mike Martin, joined by Alex and Jesse. Like a shooting star across the sky that's actually a UFO. Thank you.